Uh, everyone, so now we'll have uh, Jonathan Ullman who will tell us about algorithmic uh, stability. So thank you very much. Thanks to everyone for coming, and thanks to the organizers for inviting me. So um, what I'm going to do in my talk is I want to give sort of a high-level overview of a number of works, uh, many of which I am on, some of which are actually uh, not, not uh, mine, including uh, some, some work by some people in this room, such as Vitaly and, and Moritz and, and Thomas. Um, and please uh, stop me for questions uh, at any time. So fortunately, uh, Thomas uh, will be speaking after me on, on the same topic, and we'll dive into some of the more technical content. And so whatever I don't get to, he can just pick up where I left off. Um, so OK, so the, the basic setup, so if, if I could sort of you know, horribly mischaracterize statistics, is that typically there is a picture roughly like this, where you start with some hypothesis, you collect some data, and you draw some conclusion. And there's you know, an enormous uh, literature on statistical theory that gives you some kind of guarantee that if you've collected enough data, then whatever conclusion you draw from the data set will generalize to the population from which the data was collected. And so this is sort of the high level picture. And yet there seems to be some concern over whether this picture really reflects reality. Uh, in particular, I think I got interested in this topic many years ago reading a kind of famous paper called Why Most Published Research Findings Are False. More recently, there was an article by Gelman and Locum, uh, Loken uh, called The Statistical Crisis in Science. And if you look at the kind of subtitle on this paper, uh, it says data-dependent analysis, which they call a garden of forking paths, a reference to a short story by Borges, explains why many statistically significant comparisons don't hold up. And what this data-dependent analysis refers to, uh, among other things, is that Statistical practice often has this feedback loop. So once you draw some conclusion about your data, you sort of use it to go back and formulate some other hypothesis, maybe some refinement of the hypothesis. And then you often evaluate this new hypothesis on the same data. And because the hypothesis and the data are now related, correlated through this feedback loop, the statistical guarantees that we all know and love no longer apply in this case. So they don't apply when this data set is kind of reused interactively, which is what I'm referring to as interactive data analysis. Uh, it's sometimes called adaptive data analysis. That's another term you may have seen. So why would this come up? Like, wh why, why does this come up? Well, partly it just comes up because data is finite. So we don't want to collect a data set for a single purpose. We want to reuse data sets. Um, but more specifically, it can come up in like a number of different ways. And it's useful to think a little bit about what the different types of interaction look like. So the first and maybe most like kind of analytically friendly kind are sort of well-specified multi-stage procedures. So we're actually going to see an example of one in a little bit. But a canonical example to keep in mind is you collect some data with you know, some huge set of features. You look at this data and you select some set of relevant features. And then using the same data set, you train a model, uh, you fit some model parameters to those features. And this is a common type of thing uh, one could try, and many people have analyzed these types of procedures explicitly. But there's also kind of softer, like fuzzier kinds of interactive data analysis, such as things like data exploration, or what Gelman and Loken I think refer to as researcher degrees of freedom. So these are just ways in which the hypothesis you formulate is influenced by the data you've collected. Uh, so one example is something like, say, a data science competition. This is an example that Moritz has studied. And uh, we'll see an example uh, of this in a bit. And then there's just sort of completely ill-specified, you know, some standard data set, some sort of benchmark data set persists. It stays around for a long time. Multiple research groups reuse it. Um, and the problem here is that because here the kind of choice of hypothesis is made by an actual human or some very complicated adaptive algorithm, maybe, it's very hard to analyze these explicitly. So it's hard to kind of remove the interaction by treating these as a single process on a data set. So and we, this is sort of the, the challenge that this line of work is aimed at addressing, is when it's hard to analyze exactly what you're doing with the data set as a result of complex interaction. So there are, of course, you know, many different approaches you could take inspired by statistics. So a common one is, say, hypothesis testing or multiple hypothesis testing. These are all essentially uh, unsuitable because 
they assume throughout that the hypotheses you're testing are independent of the data, and it's not true in interactive settings. Um, people often talk about multiple hypothesis testing, such as the Bonferroni correction or the Benjamini Hochberg procedure, uh, which really are addressing a different problem. I'm not going to say exactly uh, too much about those. So, for these kinds of well specified algorithms, there's a, a long and very rich literature on kind of explicit inference procedures that, you know, treat this adaptive algorithm or this interactive procedure as kind of one algorithm and just analyze how it works. And this is tractable in some cases. One thing I would point out is that this is often more of an analysis tool. So it's often about saying what inferences can you draw in the presence of interaction and less about how can you mitigate the effects of interaction, which is more what we're interested in. And the last thing you can do is you can always kind of reduce the interactive case to the non-interactive case by just collecting more data. So either take your fixed data set and split it up and use each piece of the data once, or you know, every time you want to go back to a data set, you collect more data. But the problem here is that the, the amount of data you need grows linearly in the number of interactive rounds. So this is not very, it doesn't make a very efficient use of data. So what I want to talk about is this kind of a new general approach to interactive data analysis that tries to avoid some of these barriers. Uh, this comes from kind of a pair of works, including a, a really beautiful paper by Dwork Feldman, Hart, Patassi, Reingold, and Roth, uh, and also in a paper of Moritz and myself. And sort of what we do is we introduce both some kind of new general tools for addressing this problem of interactive data analysis, and also kind of a, a general methodology for how to think about these problems. And one thing I like about this line of work is that we actually get new algorithms for preventing the sorts of overfitting that can arise from interaction. Uh, so it's not merely analytic. We also actually have sort of algorithmic remedies for mitigating the effects. And the key ingredient in these works are sort of strong notions of algorithmic stability. So I'll talk a little bit about algorithmic stability, which comes up uh, all over the place in learning. But a key ingredient are kind of new notions of algorithmic stability that uh, we're inspired by something called differential privacy, inspired by ideas from the data privacy literature. And what you get out of these notions of stability is that often you can use randomized estimators to actually improve the generalization guarantees of your algorithms. So this is kind of a surprising way in which privacy can actually help you uh, achieve good statistical properties. And then I'll also briefly mention some new inherent bottlenecks uh, in these interactive settings, so both statistical and computational bottlenecks that suggest it may be hard to have a completely satisfactory way of addressing these problems in general, uh, which comes from works with Moritz and also with, with Thomas. So that's kind of the overview of what I want to talk about. And the first thing I want to do is I want to give sort of just an example of kind of what I mean by interaction and how it can lead to very severe overfitting um, I'm going to give sort of a very specific setting, so, so maybe unlike the kind of ill-specified settings that I talked about in the intro, but I think it just highlights the, the point and gives some, some perspective on what's going on. So here's a, a simple example of how interaction can, can go wrong. So suppose you have some population, some probability distribution, of just uniformly random labeled examples. So I have kind of an example space of plus minus 1 to the d, uh, a label space of plus minus one, it's not so important. The only thing that's important is that I want to think of this as very high dimensional. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to learn some good classifier H for mapping an example Y to uh, a label Z. And we just want to uh, maximize the prediction quality. So we want to you know, minimize the 0, 1 loss or, or maximize the correlation between the hypothesis and the labels. And a natural thing to do, of course, would just be to take your data set, this, these examples and these labels, and use the 0, 1 loss on the data set as a proxy for what you're really after, which is the 0, 1 loss on new samples from the population. This is a pretty standard classification setup. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to describe like a reasonable thing you might do that involves interaction, where you're going to overfit very badly. So this is something called Friedman's paradox, essentially. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to consider each of the D features as just an independent hypothesis. So I'm going to start with some very naive idea that maybe I could just use one of the features to predict the labels. And so that gives me D hypotheses, one for each coordinate. And here I've just sort of drawn the label vector, and here's sort of a stand-in for the 
vector of predicted labels from each of these hypotheses. And by assumption, my data is totally uniformly random, so all these vectors are random and independent. And so on average, their correlation with z is 0. But of course, it's not really 0. Sometimes it's you know, plus 1 over root n. Sometimes it's minus 1 over root n. Um, it's going to be somewhat away from 0 just due to random chance. And sometimes I'll have these blue vectors that have positive correlation, and sometimes I'll have these orange vectors that have negative correlation. So all I'm going to do is I'm just going to flip the signs of these hypotheses so that they all have positive correlation. So now what I have is a bunch of kind of independent classifiers, each of which has roughly positive 1 over root n correlation with the label, with the true labels, or the, the labels on my sample. And now I'll just take some like majority vote of these. So I have a bunch of independent kind of weak classifiers, and I'll just take a majority vote, and I will get from that one hopefully pretty good classifier. And what you can show, essentially because each of the individual classifiers is correct on a different set of labels, what you can show is that the final classifier I get will actually have correlation that grows as about uh, the square root of d over n. So if I have more and more features, I become very likely to find some classifier that predicts well. For example, if I have more than n features, I actually will find a classifier that has essentially perfect correlation with the labels on my data set. But of course, this is all just pure overfitting. My data is uniformly random, so the labels are always completely random. On, the, on new samples, no matter what hypothesis I produce, the true score is going to be 0. So what I've done is I've managed to overfit very badly. So even though I only have looked at a total of d plus 1 classifiers, I managed to produce correlation like square root d over n. And that's coming from the fact that this final classifier, h star, depends on the data. Right? I, to know which way to flip the signs, I had to look at the data. And this, this is sort of a toy example, admittedly, although I will give a, a plug for a paper by Blum and Hart and a blog post that Moritz wrote about it called Competing in a Data Science Contest Without Reading the Data, in which to a first approximation, Moritz showed that this is a really good way to look like you're winning a data science contest. So uh, I'll let you ask Moritz more about this, but the punchline is that he managed to sort of get sixth in a data contest, science contest, uh, just by doing this, but only retroactively. He did not claim any money that he, that he told me about. <laughs> so how could we avoid this trap. So this, as I said, is a pretty like, well-specified algorithm. And so we could just analyze this explicitly. There, there are lots of ways to do that. But let's think a little more broadly about like, what went wrong. So I want to take a particular perspective on why I was able to overfit to the data set so badly from this interactive attack. And the reason uh, is that what we did was we chose these d hypotheses, and then we saw their scores on the data set x. So we saw some function of the data set x. And the function might seem not terribly interesting. It's just the score of some classifier. But it turns out, in some sense, what this attack actually shows is that these scores reveal a lot of information about the unknown vector of label z. So just seeing the scores of these random classifiers tells you a lot about the labels. In fact, if d is bigger than n, you learn basically all the labels. So they reveal everything about the labels. So once you have this perspective of what went wrong, it's sort of obvious what to do. Let's try to make sure that what you learn from the first stage of the analysis doesn't reveal too much information about the labels, or more generally, doesn't reveal too much information about the data set you've collected. Okay, so that's just sort of the opposite of what went wrong in the attack. And how would we do that? Well, we're going to use ideas from differential privacy. So this is not going to be a privacy talk. I feel like over time, I've sort of talked about privacy less and less when I talk about this line of work. But the idea of how would we give accurate scores on the data in a way that doesn't reveal too much about the data set itself uh, uses techniques from privacy. That's sort of exactly the problem you want to solve in, in privacy. But the right perspective to have is that algorithms that were designed in the context of privacy actually have very strong stability guarantees in a sense that uh, I'll make precise. So first, let me talk a little bit about stability. It's like a word I've now used a bunch of times. 
And this is not new. So this has been a central concept in uh, learning theory and statistics since the 70s, going back to the work of uh, DeVroy and Wagner and uh, a number of very nice works throughout the years. And there are a lot of different stability notions. It depends a little bit on what problem you're interested in. But they all have like roughly this kind of flavor. They're all what I call output stability guarantees. And what they basically say is that if I have two data sets, x and x prime, that are close to one another, maybe they differ on a small number of samples, then when I run some algorithm A on those data sets, the output of, those, of the algorithm on the two data sets should also be close in some relevant metric. Um, OK, so the metric will, of course, depend on what the context is. But they all have this flavor that, that you have an algorithm that produces some output, and those outputs should be close to one another um, in some sense. And the problem is that algorithms satisfying this definition of stability can reveal the data set entirely. So this notion of stability does not actually bound the amount of information the algorithm reveals about x, and thus doesn't prevent overfitting in these interactive settings. So they provably prevent overfitting in non-interactive settings, but not in these interactive settings. And, and one example is the one I just showed you. So what we need is something stronger, which I call distributional stability. And let me just introduce this notion called distribution, uh, sorry, called differential privacy, which is one such definition. Uh, this was due to Dwork, McSherry, Nisim, and Smith. It's sort of very exciting for a number of reasons. But what it basically says is that if you have two data sets, x and x prime, that are close, let's say they differ on a small number of their entries, then the probability distributions, ax and ax prime, should also be close in a particular metric. So for differential privacy, that metric says for any event O, the probability of that event under the two data sets should be close by this multiplicative factor and this small additive factor. But that's not really what's important here. What's really important is just that this is some distributional stability notion, which says that the algorithm A of x should have a close distribution over outputs to a of x prime, where close is measured in some way that depends on the definition. So I'm just going to write epsilon delta there to sort of evoke the fact that there's a couple parameters. But there are many such definitions. So in fact, there's a growing family of, of notions that are, that are useful in this space. Um, and the key idea is that when you have this type of stability guarantee, this sort of distributional stability, then the algorithm A reveals little about the input x in a precise sense. And what that means is that if some person comes along and runs some algorithm A of x, they learn very little about x. And then if they interact with the data set again, they run some other procedure that now depends on A of x, it can't overfit too badly to x. And this is a concept we can formalize in a number of ways. I think Thomas will give more details on how you formalize this type of concept. I'm just going to give a high-level proof overview. And one thing I want to point out is that this definition often requires, for any non-trivial guarantee, that this algorithm A be randomized. So often, uh, the best algorithms we have satisfying these properties and the best ways we can prevent overfitting in interactive settings involve randomized algorithms A, so choosing a randomized algorithm around the data. So I have about 10 minutes left, so I want to give just like a very, very kind of high level introduction to what this buys you, and then I will defer more of the details to Thomas. So let me just give like a quick framework so that I can actually make some statements that are a little more precise than what I've said so far. So in this model, we have a population P. It's over some domain U. Don't really worry about what the domain is. And we have an IID sample x1 through xn drawn from that population. And we have some class of statistics q that we're interested in estimating. And we're interested in estimating q on p. So um, for example, we might want to know something like just you know, what fraction of, of p satisfies some property q. This is called a statistical query. But you can ask for lots of different functions of p. And what we want to do is we want to design some estimator A that gets, sort of holds in its mouth the data set X drawn from the population. And A should allow some kind of data analyst, some user, to give it a query Q. And it should give back an answer A. 
And A should somehow be close to the true answer Q of P, which usually just means uh, close as real numbers. Like it just means you know, within, say, 1%. But it can depend on what exactly Q is asking for. And of course, the challenge is that A doesn't observe P. A only has access to its sample. And so it needs to do something clever to prevent uh, overfitting, to prevent giving answers that are close to Q of X but far from Q of P. And in this setting, of course, we want to consider interactive data analysis. We don't just want to have one query Q and get one answer A. We want to allow some user to issue a sequence of queries, Q1 through QK. And we're going to allow those queries to depend on the entire transcript of what's come before. So we're not really going to make assumptions about what this kind of analyst or user is doing. Um, we, we would like to basically treat this analyst as something we don't understand. It just gives us queries. We give it answers. And we want to kind of design one estimator that works well, no matter what the analyst is trying to do. Okay. And of course, you could try making more assumptions and then maybe prove more. But, but sort of in this line of work, we've mostly been interested in what you can do on a very general model. So let me give you just one class of queries that people have looked at a lot. These are called statistical queries. So the query is specified by some bounded function on the space of samples. And you just want to know the expected value of that function on a random sample from the population. And you'd like that answer to be within alpha. So the answer lives in negative 1 to 1. So there's some small alpha that you're interested in uh, getting the answer to within. This is very simple, but it's actually a highly like, general, highly useful family of queries. It captures things like means, variances, covariances, uh, scores of a classifier. So in particular, all of the kind of questions we asked in the Friedman's paradox example are statistical queries. Uh, it can implement gradient descent. Uh, Vitaly can tell you way more about what you can do in the statistical queries model. So, I want to show you basically how we can get better accuracy for statistical queries. Uh, we can do it for a more general family of queries, but I just want to talk about statistical queries. So we already saw kind of an example of what can go wrong if you use the naive estimator, which just treats x as if it were p and answers the query uh, using x. So just estimate the statistical query as if x were the real distribution. So um, we already saw what can go wrong. So what we saw is that if you're allowing someone to ask k queries, then the error of those queries can be about square root k over square root n. So in the previous example, the number of queries was basically d plus 1, and we got error square root d over square root n. And that was just a special instance of statistical queries. And by using the scores on the data set, we were just using this empirical estimator. So, I said that we want some way of answering these queries that is stable, distributionally stable. And I said that there's this connection to privacy. So if you wanted to answer these questions in a privacy-preserving way, one of the simplest things you can do is just add independent Gaussian noise to the empirical estimates. So just add zero mean Gaussian noise with some standard deviation sigma that we'll kind of set later. And what we can show, so this comes from a paper of mine with Raif Basili, Nisim, Thomas Steinke, Adam Smith, and Uri Stemmer, and also builds on earlier work by six other people, um, is that this estimator actually has better accuracy. So if you set this noise parameter correctly, then the accuracy improves to the fourth root of k over square root of n. So we get sort of a kind of quadratic improvement in the dependence on the number of queries. And this is kind of like surprising, right? I mean, I think this is something that just sounds sort of like it goes over kind of quickly. But there's something cool here, which is that by adding noise, we can reduce the error. So by adding noise in this particular way, we improve the stability. And even though we're giving answers that are less accurate for the data set, they're more accurate for the population. So I think that's interesting. So let me give just like the very simple overview of how you would try to prove such a statement. Thomas will, I promise, say much more about it. So the first thing that you basically need to establish is that the noisy answers satisfy this distributional stability property. So if you think about an algorithm that basically takes the data set, kind of runs the analyst in its head, 
and outputs the entire sequence of queries and answers. This is a stable algorithm. And you can show this using kind of ideas from privacy or various information theoretic measures. Roughly, the idea is that changing one sample in the data set can only change this average by a small amount. And adding noise, adding Gaussian noise kind of smooths out those small changes. That's a very, very high level intuition of why this is stable in the strong sense that we need. Kind of the more interesting claim is how we use stability. So the way that you actually use stability is we prove something of the following form. So we say, suppose you have some stable algorithm m. I want to call it m to indicate that it's not a. You have some stable algorithm m. And what m does is it takes a data set and it outputs a query. It selects some query from the family of queries you're interested in, like a statistical query. And now you look at the query it selects applied to the data set and the same query that it, whoops, that it selected but applied to the population. Well, if mx you know, didn't look at the data, these would be very close by standard kind of sampling guarantees, like a Chernoff bound or central limit theorem argument. But what you can show is that if m is stable, then even though the query itself depends on x, these two quantities will be very close to one another with high probability. Okay, so intuitively, what distributional stability buys you, that kind of output stability doesn't buy you, is that no distributionally stable algorithm can output a query for which the data set and the population are different, even though we know such queries exist. You know, unless you draw an enormous number of samples, there will be queries for which x and p diverge, but a stable algorithm can't choose one. So let me just sort of skip over this. So I think with my last like two minutes, I'm just going to give you kind of why this is true. I'll prove sort of a weaker theorem, which doesn't prove that this is true with high probability, but just in expectation. Although at the level I'm going to go through the details, it doesn't really matter much. So the idea is to consider two distributions that we're going to relate to one another. So the first is the following. You choose a random record, in, a random sample in the data set, one of the n samples. And so you choose i, and then you choose that sample, so xi, the ith sample. And then you look at the query selected by the algorithm m of x. So this is like three kind of correlated random variables. The other is you choose a random i, but you just choose an independent random sample from p, independent of the data set. And then you take the query q that was selected by m of x. So these are two different, two distributions. And notice that. This expectation here is just some function applied to this distribution. And this expectation here is some function applied to this distribution. And we can relate the distributions using stability. So the first step is to say that if I start with the blue distribution, I can change it to a new distribution where instead of using x, I take the ith sample in x and I replace it with a fresh independent sample z. And distributional stability says that these two distributions are close. These two joint distributions have to be close. Then we can just sort of play with symmetry here. So here I have xi, which is now independent of what m sees, and z. And so what I can do is I can just flip these by symmetry. I can say, well, let me just put xi into m, and let me pull z out. But this is exactly the orange distribution. So this is a little kind of two-step outline of how you prove that stable algorithms cannot output queries that distinguish the data set x from the population p. So wrapping up, so this is kind of the, the main theorem. This is kind of the, the, the first thing you can do with this, is you can show that there is a stable estimator that gives better accuracy for interactive statistical queries than this naive estimator. Better meaning that we, replace, we replace a square root k dependence with a fourth root k dependence. And it has this kind of nice take home that adding random noise to the answers can actually improve the stability and reduce the overall error. Uh, you can extend this to other types of queries. I'm not going to say much about that. Also, we have lots more powerful differentially private algorithms. And in certain regimes of parameters, you can actually say much stronger things. 
So if you have data from a set of bounded dimensions, the domain has bounded dimension, then you can actually answer like exponentially many queries. You can recover sort of a logarithmic dependence on k, the number of queries that you would get in the non-interactive setting, but with some dependence on d that's kind of unpleasant. And you can also show that this dependence on d is kind of inherent. So when you have a high dimensional data set, when you actually have a data set d, uh, a data set x where the dimension is bigger than the number of queries, then you can't really hope for, for anything, uh, anything much better than, than this kind of polynomial dependence on the number of queries. Uh, another result we can show is that uh, if you do have a modestly high dimensional data set, so a dim da the dimension of the data is much smaller than the number of queries, then there are significant computational gaps in the worst case. So there's some kind of malicious analyst strategy that involves some kind of cryptography that will kind of force any accurate estimator to overfit very badly, even though we know that there are inefficient estimators that would do better. So unfortunately, I don't have too much time to go into these results, but they're based on some interesting cryptographic constructions called fingerprinting codes that I think are, are sort of surprisingly connected to this area. And um, the last thing I wanted to do is I wanted to mention uh, another very nice result of Dork et al. in which they consider a setting where we bound the number of rounds of queries. So you allow maybe a huge number of queries, but there's you know, some big batch of non-interactive queries, then another big batch of non-interactive queries, and the number of rounds is small. And what they show is that you can basically replace a polynomial dependence on the number of queries with a polynomial dependence on the number of rounds and only a logarithmic dependence on the ambient number of queries. And they have some sort of very nice application to what they call reusable holdout sets. So um, it's a very nice line of work, and unfortunately, I won't have much time to talk about. Um, and so I will just, uh, I'll just kind of wrap up there. That's the high level kind of overview of, of the model and what we're trying to do. And uh, I'll just say thanks and let Thomas give uh, more information about the specifics. Questions, comments? Yeah. So in the regime where k is much bigger than d, yeah. what, is your, what is the best thing you know in square root n, in 1 over square root n? 1 over square root n. Um, so, so the question is, uh, in this regime where, so, in this regime where uh, k is much, much bigger than d, can you get anything with square root 1 over square root n? And the answer is, uh, we don't really know of anything. Um, so, so I mean, basically, th this is the best I could get in that regime if, I want one, if you insist on 1 over root n. So it's a very nice question. Um, I guess square root d over n. Square root d over n. Just square root d over n. Um, no, no, because the number of queries is very large. So if you wanted, say, if, I mean, if you have, say, if you have like exponential in d, for example, then you could, could then you'd be okay, because then you'd have like convergence and statistical distance or something. But no, it's a, it's a very nice question. So it's something I've thought about and seems kind of challenging, but uh, maybe only for me. Thank you.